Well, ho hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Greenberg, and I'm with Erica Williams. Um, we are neuromuscular specialists, and we are going to discuss the paper Morphological and Molecular Patterns of Polymyositis with Mitochondrial Pathology and Inclusion Body Myositis, um, recently published in the Journal of Neurology. Um, this is an excellent paper, which is very stimulating and thought-provoking. And Eric and I have discussed this quite a bit and have a lot of comments for you about it. Um, we thought we might start with a quick introduction to the field more generally of inflammatory myopathies. And for that, I will just show a quick slide overview. So this is an overview of the inflammatory myopathies, which is quite helpful historically and there are several major categories outlined here, but if we look at the evolution of this field, going back into the 1800s, initially there was really one category called polymyositis. Polymyositis quickly got split off into a category that included dermatomyositis because of the obvious skin rash that certain patients had. Um, but there was almost a 90 year period during which there was no further understanding of these diseases until inclusion body myositis or IBM was noted in 1978 initially. And what you can see has happened since then is there have been a continual splitting of this category of polymyositis into better defined subcategories. So that currently what we call polymyositis is actually a very small category. We have much more specific terminology for most of the forms of myositis that were previously called polymyositis. Today, we're going to be focused specifically on this entity called PM Mito, which first appeared in the literature in 1997 as a specific type of polymyositis, polymyositis with mitochondrial pathology, and we'll be discussing its relationship to inclusion body myositis. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Erica. Uh, thank you for that. And before we dive too deep in, it, it's really a pleasure to be able to chat about this disease and disease spectrum with you um, today, um, I, in large part too, because, um, you know, inclusion body myositis is uh, in, in patients over the age of 50, like one of the more common um, inflammatory acquired myopathies. Um, and so even though it's, you know, relatively rare in the disease spectrum, it's something that we see with a lot of frequency, especially in our neuromuscular clinics. Um, and it's always, uh, you know, an interesting uh, scenario with patients because um, they, they often ask, you know, what, what, why do I have this? What is the cause? Um, and, um, and it's not all that well uh, proven or delineated exactly what the underlying pathology might be. And some of this work are, are important steps to try to provide answers about that. And then, of course, you know, the other part of it is it's not, um, IBM is not considered a treatable condition yet. Um, and so diving into the molecular identity, um, as this paper does, um, uh, and, and as you and others in the field have done, is really important you know, next steps in terms of approaching um, this condition and, um, and taking care of the patients with it. Um, well, I, I agree. I always like to say it's rare for epidemiologists, but common for neuromuscular specialists. Disease, so <laughs> yeah. We see a lot of it, despite the that's numbers. Really, that's really true. Um, uh, so, I mean, I guess, and I guess in that context, you know, the other interesting kind of general uh, statement to make before diving into the details of the paper is, um, th I think there are a lot of conceptual parallels with the IBM field and, and kind of a neurodegenerative condition field where, you know, that slide that you showed from the, you know, the evolution of the disease from, uh, the de that definition of it from 1978 forward, like this was a time when a lot of things were characterized by histologic patterns, um, and, um, and less was understood about um, the kind of molecular basis of disease. Um, and, um, and, you know, this is not so dissimilar from the, the early and kind of foundational observations in diseases like Alzheimer's um, or Parkinson's um, and, um, and um, that, um, that, that are observational, but, but have led to kind of a, a, a strong desire for a better molecular characterization. So with that, um, Maybe, maybe I'll jump into what the, the paper itself is trying to say, um, say about that. Um, and, that would be great, um, yeah. So the, the main point that the paper, this paper is trying to make is that 
you know, this subtype of inflammatory myopathy, PM mito, is actually part of the spectrum of inclusion body myositis. And not only that it's part of the spectrum, but that it might represent kind of an early manifestation of that disease. Um, and that, that patients with, with PM mito um, ultimately go on to develop IBM and that these diseases share a, a, a molecular underpinning. Um, and so it, to do that, they, they present kind of, I think, three main categories of evidence. The, the first category of evidence they, that they look at um, are you know, markers that PM mito and inclusion body myositis um, have in common, and specifically, you know, molecular markers. Um, and so they they first they demonstrate that most I think in figures one and in figures two. Now in figure one, what they're doing is they're they're taking human muscle biopsies um, from patients with PM mito and from patients with IBM and from non-disease controls. They're extracting the RNA from those samples. They're synthesizing cDNA from that, and then they're running PCR, um, you know, quantitative PCR. Um, uh, on those samples for uh, for a panel of genes, and um, and what they're showing you in Figure One is this you know the the copy number or the the, the cycle number that's required in order to detect these genes, um, and the conclusion that they're trying to reach here um, is that um, uh, PM mito and IBM have uh, have a different gene expression pattern compared to non-disease controls, but they're similar to each other. I think we can see this here. This is the figure 1B that you're referring to, yeah. which looks at a variety of molecules which are downstream of um, interferon gamma or type 2 interferon. Um, and Erica's referring to the very similar expression levels of PSMB8, for example, or these HLA markers that are present in both PMIDO and in IBM. It's a quite a nicely presented figure, I think, in the sense that you know they're they're showing us the data point for every single sample, um, and they're including their you know in a scatter plot, and there's very nice statistical analysis there. But I was curious, you know, from your perspective, right, that these gene panels that they've chosen and these downstream markers, like how does that fit into the the context of the kind of molecular characterization of IBM to this point? Yeah, I mean they're they're mostly well known expression like HLA molecules, if you recall the figure, are well-known upregulated, not just in IBM, but in most forms of inflammatory myopathy. Um, so th they do certainly clearly put um, PM mito in the category of inflammatory myopathy, um, but they're, they're not extremely specific for um, certain pathways that are well-known to be upregulated in, in IBM. Um, and you'll hit a couple of those, I think, and coming up on other other slides where they do get into that. So, yeah. And the figure I'm does sure. lack another inflammatory myopathy disease control, you know, like dermatomyositis or immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. So it, it might be that what's being, you know, the control is non-disease control, right? So it's possible that, you know, that common signature is not just common to PM, mito, and IBM, but across the whole spectrum of inflammatory myopathies. Mm. I wonder. I wonder then. You know, Figure Two, the uh, splicing patterns and quantity of cryptic exons. This this one I may speak a little more specifically to this disease, but it took me a little bit of digging in order to understand the context for this figure. So, I, I, what they're trying to measure here. Um, are, um, are inclusions of, of cryptic exons. Um, and so the reason that they think they're looking at this is that um, you, know, you and others have described in inclusion body myositis that there's a redistribution of TDP43. Um, and this is important because TDP43, what does that stand for? That stands for a TAR uh, DNA binding protein. Um, and TDP43 binds to RNA um, and can change the splicing at these cryptic exon sites. And so usually in other literature, in the ALS FTD literature, um, it represses inclusion of these cryptic exons in the final RNA transcript. Um, and so the idea here is that if TDP43 or uh, uh, TAR DNA binding proteins are not working as they should, then there's increased inclusion of these cryptic exons. And so that's what's being graphed um, from these samples from patients with IBM and PM mito. And again, they argue here that 
there's some similarity between IBM and PM Mito because you know you'll see in the healthy controls that there's not um, inclusion or kind of minimal inclusion of these cryptic exons. But in in PM Mito, it looks like there starts to be a little bit of inclusion, and then in IBM itself, the you know uh, in those confirmed cases, um, that inclusion is even greater. Um, so um, so the, I think the 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 argument you know, reached through this historical literature about molecular patterns in IBM is that PM Mito is, is like it um, and is an intermediate step to development of the full um, pathology. There's no temporal information right in this in this figure. It's just right. comparable to the other, but that's the implication. No, that's that's exactly right. So and I think the, the authors do ultimately suggest that there's a spectrum here. Um, and it's a spectrum of various different elements, right? So it's many of these patients clinically do not have the very characteristic distal weakness that IBM patients have. Some of them do, um, but they're, you know, that's the other clinical distinction typically between PM and IBM is the pattern of weakness, the treatment responsiveness. I'm not sure if you were gonna get into that issues as well. I would want me to further elaborate, but you're welcome to if you were going to. Maybe I, I would love to hear your thoughts more about sure. that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I mean, so I think these patients are often initially, some of the earliest reports of the, the initial paper in 1997 actually emphasized the quadriceps weakness that the PM mito patients had. So to the extent that they look like IBM patients may actually depend on how carefully you examine them um, and look at them. I think some of them look fairly IBM like, uh, you know, early on as well, but there's definitely some patients who don't and they have greater proximal weakness deltoids and biceps than you typically see in patients with IBM, um, which is quite intriguing because it begs the question as to whether there really is a transitional state. Um, because some of these patients will respond to corticosteroids um, initially as well. Um, and I think this is where the molecular data here, I'll let you still you know, continue with the molecular discussion when you get to that, but that's the little teaser here as to how we understand the evolution from a treatment responsive, almost, you know, polymyositis-like disease um, to one that becomes IBM and what the molecular underpinnings of that might be. Um, and just so if we didn't, if we weren't clear on that, um, I forget how many patients are in this series, 20 or something, 20 25? 25, um, but there were 13 patients that had long-term, or was it 13 that had, 14 patients that had a long-term follow-up? Yeah. Um, and 13 of them ultimately di were diagnosed with IBM, so that 93% of the patients that they have long-term follow-up here um, were ultimately diagnosed with IBM, which is an important thing to, to put out there um, as we talk about this thing being a transition to IBM. Like a, that's a great piece of of truly temporal data <laughs> progression, clinical progression, and histologic progression as well as we'll see. Right. Um, I mean, I think I think what you're alluding to is you know the kind of next category of data in terms of the molecular distinctions between PM mito and IBM that they start to address next. You know, in the next figure, for example, in Figure Three, um, and I know. Um, I know some of the differences that they point out here are very like, near and dear to your heart and your work, um, but but it's it speaks to kind of very interesting uh, potential mechanisms um, why one would go from a, a partially treatable condition to one that's not. And um and before we dive into the details of that data, I, again I think there's some interesting conceptual parallels. I don't pretend to be an expert in autoimmune diseases of the nervous system, but. Um, but it seems to mirror, you know, thinking about, um, you know, patients with MS, for example, there's like a treatment responsive relapsing remitting period um, that later evolves into a treatment resistant or largely treatment resistant, but still presumably autoimmune uh, progressive phase. Um, and um, maybe I, I think the, uh, this idea, you know, uh, is, is mimicked in, in conceptually and how PM mito might might relate to IBM. I don't know, do you think that's a fair comparison? Um, what, what they show in this figure are, um, you know, using the same methods that we had discussed in figure one, um, looking at, uh, at um, 
patterns of uh, expression levels in genes. They found a number of, uh, of genes that were differentially expressed between the PM mito uh, and the IBM samples. Um, uh, namely, um, these, these two in particular stood out, KLRG1 and um, GBP6. Um, and so these, um, as you can see by the figure, um, are minimally expressed in non-disease controls and minimally expressed in PM mito, but are upregulated in IBM uh, samples. Um, and then they have some histological characterizations to the left where they show kind of an increased prominence of staining um, of, of these markers um, in IBM samples compared to PM mito samples. Um, and, um, and, you know, these are very interesting markers um, and, um, and I mean, I, I know that this is part of what you have been working on a, a great deal. So I, 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 would, I would love to hear the kind of history of the evolution of these markers and kind of what, what, they, what they signify. Um, I think it speaks very much to this kind of refractory immune state. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very intriguing observation that there's a sort of broad, less specific immune signature that's in common, which was what figure one was. Um, but if you try and understand what's really different molecularly in IBM and PM mito here, um, these are the only two molecules they identified. Now, GBP6 is an interferon gamma inducible protein. Um, so, and I think it's more specific. So I think there is, this does suggest a greater amount of interferon gamma is present in IBM muscle compared to PM mito. Um, but KLRG1 is a marker of highly differentiated T cells. So whereas T cells are present in both diseases, histologically and PM mito, I think one of the biggest difference is the differentiation of the T cells, which takes time. So this, you know, you can imagine PM mito developing over years into IBM and being accompanied further differentiation of the KLRG1 of the T cell population. And as these T cells become more differentiated, they start to express KLRG1 on them. And that would be, um, and that would be an agreement with the data that's being produced here. And it's always intrigued me as to why this disease is often, um, why it is a refractory disease. And this is one potential explanation is that as T cells do differentiate into highly differentiated cells, they are more refractory to control by immunosuppressive agents. There's a rich literature about how corticosteroids will make naive T cells become apoptotic and eliminate mm -hmm. them, but not this population. Similarly, this highly differentiated population is not particularly proliferative. And so methotrexate, for example, will not affect their their growth and survival. So it is very, very intriguing. Um, you know, of course, if, if you're a carpenter, everything looks like a hammer is the expression. And I've been intensely interested in KLRG1 for a long time. So I might be a little biased in, in my views, but I think I'm objective in saying that it's, an, it's intriguing that the development of treatment refractoriness is accompanied by markers of highly differentiated T cells which are separately known to be refractory to, to treatment. And as you bring up, this is a very important point with regard to MS because MS shares some features as the disease becomes very chronic, it can become quite refractory to prevention of progression. And often this has been viewed by, you know, by immunologists in the MS community as a sign that it's a, something magically called degenerative and no longer autoimmune. Um, but I think an alternative explanation is that it's very highly differentiated autoimmunity that's not controlled with most of the drugs that are, are available, um, rather than to view it as no longer an immune-mediated pathology. Yeah. To what extent is it still a debate in the, in the IBM field that this is an autoimmune condition versus other? I understand it's, it's, really con it's, it's still quite controversial. It really depends on who you ask. And I think um, not so many people are willing to stick their neck out anymore. 10 years ago, I think there was, you know, very divided opinions about that. Um, and I think some of the genetic data has helped to convince a lot of people. The exome, genome-wide exome sequencing and mapping 
has shown an extremely high peak associated with an MHC locus, an HLA haplotype, which is common to autoimmune disease. So I think that's been somewhat convincing to many people that this really is autoimmunity. Um, you know, the you know, this paper, I think, would, would continue to push in that direction. Even the authors make that same point as well, that this would likely explain the treatment refractoriness of IBM. Right now, what we have in terms of the data for this paper are, are comparisons between one patient population and another, the PM mito population, the IBM population. And so there we have at this point, by this data, you know, a disease that is diseases that are similar and they're also different. Um, and, and they're similar and different in these intriguing ways, but what they really want to show is that, um, you know, there's some temporal progression. And as you had mentioned earlier, they, it's, a, it's a single statement in the paper, but quite powerful, this 13 out of 14 patients with PM Maidu, who, who they have follow-up for, who progress clinically um, to, to, to meet criteria um, for, for IBM. Um, but they also have um, in, the, in figure five, a, a kind of unusual or, or difficult to obtain data set. Um, it's a small sample size, probably because of that difficulty, but they have two patients um, who had serial biopsies. Um, and so they were P initially diagnosed with PM mito. Um, and then uh, later uh, went on to, to develop IBM. Um, and, um, and they have biopsies from the PM mito stage and the IBM stage. Um, and um, I, I wish that they had more like, quantification and internal controls here, but the conclusions are still quite intriguing. Right, where they suggest that you know these two markers in these specific patients comparing their PM mito biopsy and IBM uh, biopsy that they do see increased you know strength of staining and expression um, uh, you know within the same patient over time. Um, right. Well, that would definitely be the next step if if somebody has enough of these patients to go ahead and and try and accumulate longitudinal data on a cohort of individual patients. As you point out, this previous study is, is not a longitudinal study. There's very little longitudinal data. Um, so you can associate two diseases, but it would be even stronger to be examining carefully these, these patients over a period of time in a sufficient cohort. Um, that would be a great next step for sure. Yeah, intriguing indeed, yeah. Um, or, or maybe, intervening upon the KLRG1 pathway and seeing if you can modify disease progression. Right, well, that's, that's, that's in progress too. So we do have a summary slide to just say where things have been and where things have gone, are going. So this is sort of a summary of the historical view of these three entities and various um, pathological and clinical features. So historically, PM and IBM had been viewed as quite similar as diseases in which there's T cell invasion that's occurring. IBM was viewed as it has this additional thing called rim vacuoles um, and also differs by its corticosteroid responsiveness. And then PM Mito entered the field in the late 1990s as a kind of intermediary. It still had the T cell invasion. It does not have the rim vacuoles. If it did, these patients wouldn't be called PM Mito, they'd be called IBM. It has mitochondrial pathology like IBM has, um, but it's more responsive than IBM, sort of for treatment somewhere in between PM and IBM. And I think where we're evolving is one, this entity of PM is gradually disappearing and being replaced with more specific diagnoses. And the authors of this paper suggest that IBM has a transitional or early phase and then a more obvious later phase um, that are characterized by very common features, T cell invasion, mitochondrial pathology. But the earlier phase is a little bit more corticosteroid responsive here than the later phase, and is also marked molecularly by an absence of the highly differentiated T cells, which occur later in IBM. I emphasize here the concept of the rim vacuoles, although this is a very important clinical concept because many patients are frankly denied a diagnosis of IBM because they don't have rim vacuoles. Mm -hmm. The literature really suggests that rim vacuoles are irrelevant. Um, they're certainly very noticeable when you see them. And so people's thoughts are directed towards the diagnosis of IBM. Um, but they're, the absence of the rim vacuoles um, really quite irrelevant to the clinical features, clinical course, treatment responsiveness of these diseases. Um, 
and really unfortunately still prevent certain patients from getting this diagnosis because they don't have a rim vacuoles. So Very it's definitely been a pleasure talking about this today. Any other comments that you want to get in for our audience? Um, no, thank you for that excellent okay. summary. Um, and thank you for the great perspective of the, you know, evolution of this field over, um, over time. Um, and hopefully it will, you know, feed into a broader literature um, and effort to, to finding some answers for, for this patient population. All right. Well, thank you for all the points that you made and for the nice discussion. Yeah, it was really fun. And thank everybody for listening.